darlings! Happy Valentine's Day! I love the 1920s and I feel like I don't appreciate it enough. So I am going to be making a 1920s Valentine's Day dress. And as always, I like to draw out my design so I know what fabric I'm going to need. And for this particular design, I was very much inspired by some beautiful 1920s fashion plates or fashion illustrations, which would have been advertisements they had in the magazines at the time. My main inspiration was the yellow dress on the right, but instead of having it yellow, I had to make it pink because it's Valentine's Day. And with the fabric choices available, the best bet was pink. There wasn't the right red fabrics, so I went with pink. So at the fabric store, I picked out two beautiful fabrics. I picked out a rayon satin for the slip underneath and a sheer embroidered mesh for the exterior. And I have to say, after I washed these fabrics, I just couldn't get over how silky soft that rayon satin was. I literally just want to own everything in this fabric. I just want to make myself a whole new wardrobe completely out of rayon satin. <laughs> Alright, anyway, I was very much overwhelmed by that. But the mesh fabric was beautiful as well. It was very sheer and thin and worked perfectly for what I needed it for. So because I don't have a purchase pattern for this, I've just made it up from a picture, I'm using my nightgown as reference. Because nightgowns can be pretty shapeless, they're just straight up and down, which is very similar to 1920s dresses. They all had a very straight cut because they were trying to resemble men's clothes a little bit. They weren't wanting to hug the feminine figure, they didn't want an hourglass silhouette. They wanted it very boyish, so it works perfectly. So if you have a nighty and you want to make a 1920s dress, just use that as your template. It was actually pretty easy to follow. I just followed the outline of my nightgown and used that as reference and cut straight around, making sure to leave a seam allowance. I only cut out the front side just because I wanted to make sure that that was the exact size that I was going to need because I didn't want to cut too small a piece. So I did the first side and it was perfect, so then I cut out the second piece and made sure that that was able to fit around the mannequin while still giving that boyish look so it's not tight fitting around the waist. After pinning the fabric on the mannequin, I was able to determine where my hips will be and from there that will be where the belt wraps around and also where I'm going to be adding in some additional triangles triangular pieces of fabric on each side and that gives enough leg room so that you're able to walk and so it looks really pretty and flows down and it was actually a style that they had in a lot of dresses having that triangular art deco piece of fabric in their garments. I was being extra careful with this mesh fabric because I knew that I wanted to pin everything before I sewed it because I had no idea how I was going to unpick the mesh. It just looked ridiculously complicated. But this is the triangular piece that I pinned in to trial to see whether it was the right size. And as before, I measured from the hip to the floor. And with that measurement, that was what I used to create my triangular piece. And it wasn't any particular size. It was just enough, a large enough size that I could put that onto each side. It wouldn't add too much bulk and it would give me enough room so that I was able to walk. Since I'd pinned everything beforehand, I knew that I was able to go ahead and start sewing and it would be okay, I wasn't going to have to unpick anything. So I went ahead and sewed right down the side seams to the hips and then from the hips I sewed in the side triangles. And obviously sewing the top shoulders together if you're happy with the neckline. So as you can see here, the triangles fit perfectly and overall it works really well, it's really swishy on the sides and I couldn't be happy with the design that I just created. <laughs> Especially when you are creating your own patterns and drafting patterns, it's really helpful being able to put it on a mannequin rather than having to dress yourself in it each time. So it really helps being able to put it on the mannequin and have a look at it and then just slip it straight off and then continuing with your sewing. Here is a little bit of a close-up so you can see the triangle and how it lies with the rest of the dress. Hello! It's the second day and I've pretty much finished the exterior of the dress. I just need to trim the shoulders and trim the bottom of the dress as well. But before I get to that, I'm going to make this slip so I can determine how long I actually want this dress to be. 
Now to cutting out the slip. Don't want any of that upper strap half that I had with the exterior of the dress. I want that to be straight on the top. I'm just cutting down alongside the nightgown the same as before and making sure to leave enough seam allowance. I did end up turning up the bottom of the nightie because I don't want the slip to be floor length so it is a little bit lower than my knees and then I will just modify the exterior of the dress after. So my plan was to add some little triangular side sections to allow enough room to get in and out of the slip but I didn't actually realize how small I made the main part of the slip. So <laughs> I was kind of freaking out. I thought, oh my gosh, I've definitely destroyed this. It doesn't even close on one side. But anyway, I ended up fixing the situation and I just created larger triangular parts because I only had a certain amount of fabric and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm definitely gonna run out. But it all ended up being okay. Even though these side panels were a mistake from me miscalculating my body measurements, um, it actually ended up turning out well and especially because the side panels are actually historically accurate and the 1920 slips did have side sections that helped with that classic shape. I put the dress over the slip on the mannequin to just make sure that there was no bulging and that the slip was the correct size before I could take that off and sew it all together. As I mentioned before, I am going to cut around the bottom of the dress, but I just want to finish the slip before I do that so that I cut it at the right length. It was starting to get dark outside, but I wanted to continue sewing and finish it so I can show you all the grand reveal. Now that the seams are sewn together, the next step is to iron. With delicate silky fabrics like silk, or satin or some sort of blend, it is always best to iron on the reverse so you don't damage that nice sheen that the fibre has. After I ironed the slip, it was time to then attach the bias binding to the top and this is going to stop it from fraying and also going to give it a nice finish on top that we can then attach the straps to. Before going ahead and attaching the straps, I like to pin it on the mannequin so I know the exact length that it needs to be. To make my job a bit easier, I decided to use bias binding for the straps. As a fastening for the back, I am using press studs and it's just a fold of fabric so that the back is not gaping. It's not very professional, but I don't really know what sort of closures they would have used on the back of the slips, so I'm just making do and it worked out fine in the end. You don't see it through the exterior of the dress, so it's all good with me. Now with the strap length perfectly adjusted, I can sew that together. And in no professional manner, I just went away kind of at hacking the bottom of the dress, but I tried to give it a little bit of a petal shape, so some bits are lower than others and yeah, so it just looks a little bit more romantic and fluttery. With the extra material that I chopped off here, that can be used for the belt. There is nothing wasted in this project. Now I'm finished. Are you ready for the reveal? A common hairstyle in the 1920s was the Marcel or finger wave, and this was often accompanied by a short bob, but deciding to chop off your hair was a very serious deal. This was because long hair was considered to be beautiful and feminine, and short hair was thought to be boyish and manly. Not all women committed to the bob, but instead styled their hair in a way as to look like they had short hair. Long hair was carefully arranged around the base of the neck in a small bun or chignon. By the 1920s, department stores and pharmacies around the world all had makeup counters. The shame around using makeup products disappeared, and women finally felt comfortable purchasing the most recent powders, vanishing creams, pan sticks, lipsticks, 
and mascara as it was originally called. Eyebrows were plucked and a brown pencil was used to fill the brows out and draw the ends down towards the temple. Concealer as we know it today didn't exist in the 1920s, only face powder was used, but since I want a bit more coverage I'm going to use it. Cream rouge was applied in a circular shape on the apples of the cheeks. A little rouge could even be applied onto the chin to make it appear more prominent. Eyeshadow was often matched to your eye colour. Eyeliner or a dark eyeshadow was used against the lash line. And to finish beautifying the eyes, a cake mascara should be used. The face should be powdered as a more matte looking complexion was very popular. The first swivel lipstick tube was invented in 1915. Beforehand, lipstick was used in little pots similar to the rouge used before. I'll be wearing a red shade, which is an exact replica of a lipstick from 1920. The popular lip shape was smaller than the natural lips and emphasized the cupid's bow. The lipstick is applied to the center of the lips and is faded to the lip corners. 